This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be considered legal, medical, or mental health advice. The views and opinions expressed do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of the podcast and are not intended to malign any religion, group, club, organization, business, individual, anyone, or anything. I'm Sarah Edmondson. And I'm Anthony, air quotes, nippy, Ames. And this is A A Little Little Bit Bit Culty. A podcast about what happens when things that seem like a great thing at first go bad. Every week we chat with survivors, experts, and whistleblowers for real cult stories told directly by the people who lived through them. Because we want you to learn a few things we've had to learn the hard way. Like if you think you're too smart to get sucked into something culty, you're already prime recruitment material. You might even already be in a cult. Oops. You better keep listening to find out. Welcome to season six of A Little Bit Culty. Welcome back, listeners. This week, we've got another remix episode in your feed. Consider it as a summer smorgasbord of culty content to tide you over between new content and new episodes. Kind of like a charcuterie board. Yeah, sure. Some goat cheese, some pickles. Okay. You want meat on that, don't you? <laughs> what is the meat of this episode? Would you say it's the, the therapy episode? Romani's always pretty meaty. This week, the meat of the episode, we're heading back to the therapist couch. So just lay back, get comfy because the doctors are in to talk about everything therapy, including how to heal from past trauma and dealing with those pesky narcissists in your life. And there's so many these days, aren't they? Just popping up like little moles. No, they've been there. We're just catching. Mm -hmm. Today, you'll hear highlights from past chats with Dr. Robin Stern, Dr. Romney, and Dr. Christine Cochilla. How does that make you feel? How does that make you feel? What is the meaning of that? Where do you feel that? (sighs) First things first, we're sharing all things gaslighting with psychotherapist Dr. Robin Stern. And by all things, we mean all things. Dr. Stern literally coined the term the gaslight effect. Very impressive. Let's dive into it, shall we? Dovin. Dovin. Well, it's very interesting that you say that because right now I'm engaged in some research really to delineate the different levels, if you will, of gaslighting along that spectrum from something that's mild to something that's soul destroying, right? Right. Because sometimes when I write about it or I speak about it, somebody will say, well, that's not gaslighting because it's too mild or that sounds like it's just bad behavior. But gaslighting has several hallmarks, if you will. Mm -hmm. So gaslighting is when somebody, it's an insidious type of emotional abuse repeated over time in a power relationship. That's really important. Repeated over time within a relationship where the one person has power. The person in power seeks to undermine your reality, your character, and sometimes leads you to second guess yourself to the point where you feel like you're going crazy. Mm -hmm. So there the gaslighter is seeking to sow seeds of doubt by pivoting, by insisting that their reality is the reality and moving the conversation from taking responsibility or answering your question, or even seeing agreeing about what's real out there to blaming you, Mm -hmm. deflecting responsibility and telling, you no. Your perceptions are not accurate. And in fact, there's something wrong with you. Wow. So does that sound like how people get into a cult? Yeah. Well, you know, we're obviously hearing this from the perspective of how it gets talked about mostly right now, which is in relationships and then politics, which we can talk about later. Mm -hmm. But obviously this on a little bit culty, we're thinking about how all of this was done, you know, to us and to pretty much every survivor we've ever spoken to. And I think it's really important also for people to understand the, where it comes from. Can you speak a little bit to the to where you got the term from, the film and originally the play? Sure. So the term gaslight effect is mine based on what I saw was the impact of gaslighting over time in the patients I was treating. But gaslighting, the term gaslight comes from originally a play, 1938, by Patrick Hamilton that was made into a very popular movie, 1944, Gaslight, starring Ingrid Bergman and Charles Boyer. 
where the diabolical husband takes advantage of his adoring wife who puts him on a pedestal and loves him and follows his every word. And the diabolical husband is trying to, we know as the audience, steal her family jewels. But what she believes is that he's just loving her. And yet he keeps telling her things about herself that initially she says, but don't be silly. No, I'm not forgetful. That's just silly. Mm. This is the way I would describe it in Mm. the movie, watching the movie. I think she might even say, don't be silly. No, really? I'm not forgetful. And yet in the movie in about seven minutes and in real life, it could be seven days or seven months, you see her devolve from this strong, confident, sure of herself and her mind, woman, to really second guessing herself and beginning to think, maybe he's right. Maybe I am forgetful. And of course, in the intervening time in the movie, he is stealing the brooch that he gave her as a gift. And he said, I'm going to put this in here. You can't wear it today because it's broken. So let's just save it in here. And then she'll say, okay, of course, you know, you remember I'm putting it in, in your bag. And she would say, of course I remember. And I think she did say, don't be silly. And then of course he steals it out of the, the bag. And then she's looking for it and she becomes frantic and she becomes exhausted from being frantic. And at the end of that scene, she says, Gregory, just his name in the movie, I lost it. Maybe you're right. So she starts to doubt her own reality, and which she orchestrated. Exactly. Okay. Yes, he orchestrated the whole thing. And in real life, many people are not quite that diabolical. Right. They're not out to steal your jewels, but they are out to insist their goal is to have the power in the relationship, to insist on their reality, to make sure that your reality is their reality and you're joining them. Right. And I would imagine that I really want to hear about your experience. And I know this is your podcast and you're asking me, but I really want to hear about what happened and how you were intreated into this relationship with this power figure. Absolutely. We're also to solicit ourselves, happy to come on yours to go into Yay. <laughs> go into, to some of those details. I'm sure we, we will. Yeah. Some people say we talk too much in our podcast, so we try not to, but it's hard to not relate these things to our experiences. Well, I mean, it is our experience. That is our lane. But in the Gaslight movie, it is a real insidious, like the person has malintent. And the I intent to deceive. The intent to deceive. And yes. there's a difference. And I think most of our audience aren't people that have insidious intent if they're listening to our, our podcast, but there's certainly things that I recognize in your book. that's like, I've for sure done that behavior, right? Mm-hmm. And I think more to like, like my first couple of relationships where I just was not strong enough emotionally to look at something. So I deflected and made it the other person. And then when the relationship ended, I would argue a little emotionally more mature, looked back and was like, that was not cool behavior because I kind of knew I was wrong and wasn't strong enough to admit I was wrong. And I think one of the things we talked about in your book is a lot of times it's men that uh, that are doing this to women because I just want to have a persona of strength and me admitting weakness at that point would conflict with my ego. So then I quote gaslit the person to deny it. And and I don't think I had insidious intent other than I just wanted to fortify my self-image to the person that, you know, so I think what are the distinctions between that? And how do you think that sets up in our culture? Like where it's a lot of men doing, would you say that it's a lot of men doing it to women predominantly? Well, I would say yes. Certainly in my own experience as a, yeah. as a therapist, I've seen more women come in to talk about their gaslighting partners. Yeah. But before I go into that, I want to thank you and say that I love that you're telling your listening audience that you were gaslighting people. Yeah, I didn't know I was, I was doing that. I, I, I was didn't just, know it, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And you couldn't have said it better than to describe that at a time where you were uncomfortable or you couldn't say your feelings or you were destabilized, yeah. that you moved into gaslighting. It was the only thing I knew how to do. Yeah, as a way yeah. of managing the moment, as a way of reestablishing yeah. your sense of self and your sense of power in that, in that mm-hmm. moment. And the reason that I'm I'm calling that out in this way is that people say to me all the time, are some men just born gaslighters? The answer is no, they're not born gaslighters. It's a socially learned behavior strategy. 
And either you saw somebody doing it, you were a target of someone doing it or a victim of someone doing it to you, or you just happen into it because at the moment you can't take responsibility. You don't want to admit something. You feel like you're on the spot and it's much easier to say, what's the matter with you? You're so paranoid Mm -hmm. or like, what's wrong with you? You're so sensitive. And then of course your gaslight tea partner walks away forgetting about what she just asked you about or accused you of or worried about and is now thinking, oh my God, I'm so sensitive. Mm -hmm. Sensitive and needy. That's me. And needy. (laughs) You're so needy. What's your problem? And that's the the truth is that I am needy. Good for you. (laughs) And we've just come out of a call also where like we're not supposed to have needs. So expressing them has been very difficult. Both of us expressing needs to each other has been very difficult. Well, it was difficult before I was in a cult. The times where I've recognized, oh, I think I was gaslighting. I guess my primitive term was I was being a little bit of a dick. But basically, I would feel weak and vulnerable. And a show of strength was to deny the reality of what was going on and make it about the other person. Mm Mm-hmm. Or something to deflect yeah. me from looking at what I kind of was recognizing it as true, but didn't want to own on the spot, I guess. And so I think to answer your earlier question, or at least to begin to, I think a lot of men need to have that ideal, ideal self out front. Yeah, of strength. Like you're strong and you don't like being vulnerable. It's kind of icky and other people yeah. may think it's weak. And vulnerability means showing your insides to something right? You have to really feel psychologically safe. And if you haven't grown up feeling like experiencing psychological safety and knowing how to maneuver when you feel at the edges of that, if you're losing it, it's hard to step into that. So what happens if things go wrong? So it makes sense. People, you know, kids and adults too come to their defensive behaviors because we're smart. We don't want to get hurt. We want to be self-protective, right? They're not always the most helpful, obviously. And I would never use the term you did, like behaving like a dick. I would yeah. never say that. Well, but um, it's certainly not My helpful, words, of right? course. <laughs> but it's certainly not pro-relationship and isn't, right. also doesn't really convey any information. It doesn't help you to really name all. what you were doing. Right. And so that you can do something about it. This podcast certainly would not be happening without our amazing, supportive, generous patrons. Are you with us? Come find us over on Patreon at patreon.com slash a little bit culty for bonus episodes, ad free and exclusive content, and the occasional Zoom with fan favorites from our past episodes, Q and A's and all sorts of goodies. It's fun over there, people. When it comes to gifting, it's truly the thought that counts. There's also the fun element of surprise that you don't get when you're shopping for yourself, like I tend to do. But you know what you do get when you're shopping for yourself? Exactly what you wanted. And if you're buying jewelry for yourself, there's no better place to do it than BlueNile.com. Blue Nile offers thousands of independently graded diamonds and fine jewelry at prices significantly below traditional retail. So whether you're looking for something special to get yourself or to give the best gift of all time to a loved one, Blue Nile offers some of the highest quality standards in the industry. Take the classic route with a white gold tennis bracelet, hint, hint, nippy, want it for my birthday, or snap on some modern and stylish diamond huggy hoops, which are obviously very in right now. There's a ton of options to choose from. Feeling a bit overwhelmed? Me too, I get it. But if you have questions, Blue Nile's jewelry experts are on hand 24-7 via phone or chat. From technical questions to budget suggestions, they're here to help you find the piece you can feel great about, whether you're gifting it to yourself or someone else. I've been curious about the perfect length for an everyday necklace lately, and I can't wait to grill the Blue Nile experts on the topic. I am going to take them to the mat. I've also been browsing the site's Design Your Own Pendant feature, and I look forward to finding the perfect chain to pair it with. Blue Nile also offers peace of mind with every purchase. With 30-day returns and a diamond price match guarantee, they make online jewelry shopping easy, which shouldn't be a surprise because they've been doing it since 1999. So what are you waiting for? Go to BlueNile.com to find the perfect piece today. That's BlueNile.com. BlueNile.com. Enjoy! Papa Murphy's Triple Pet Pizza is the perfect harmony of three different types of pepperoni all together on one delicious take-and-bake pizza. Like our mini cup pepperoni, it's a little cup of crunch in every bite. And our classic pepperoni, the go-to all-time favorite pizza topping. And don't forget our giant pepperoni. It's perfect for the biggest pepperoni lovers. So order Papa Murphy's limited time triple pep pizza for just $12.99 today. 
You've heard from our sponsors. Now let's get back to a little bit culty, shall we? Like turning the heat up on the stove, it's so interesting that gaslighting can take different levels in intensity. Like a mild gaslighter telling you their gaslighting is, quote, not that bad, is in and of itself gaslighting. Oh, the irony. If you want to explore more of Dr. Robin Stern's study into gaslighting, check out her podcast, The Gaslight Effect. From casual gaslighting to full-blown narcissism, our next clip is from our chat with Dr. Ramani Dervasala, licensed clinical psychologist and YouTuber covering all things narcissism and more. She is legit the goat in this field. She specializes in identifying narcissistic behaviors and how to heal from relationships with a narcissist. Dive in. Let's take a listen. All joking aside, yeah. though, you know, I was reading it and I was going to Sarah. I was like, oh my God, I do some of these. Like, I'm like, I was, some of it was kind of horrifying to be quite honest with you. And, you know, Sarah reassured me. She's like, you're a good person. I was like, thank you. And, you know, <laughs> she's petting me and, and all that stuff. You bring up an important point though, right? Because I think that when people, first of all, I think the problem is, is that we hear the word narcissist and we view it as a black or white, yes. right? You either yes. are, you aren't. Right. It's not that simple, right. right? Or we view it diagnostically, which we're even throwing that out completely. But it's, it's a continuum, but it's also not just one thing. So just because maybe, I don't know, someone interrupts you or talks over you, or maybe even monopolizes the conversation, that doesn't make them a mm-hmm. narcissistic person. Mm-hmm. Or they talk about their day first and may not wait to hear about your day. That doesn't make them a narcissistic person. Now, if that happened every single day, every conversation with just about everyone they encountered, maybe we're smelling it, but you got to have all the other stuff, Mm -hmm. the entitlement and the variable empathy and the grandiosity and the control and the power obsession and all the stuff. Like again, a carrot is not soup. Flour is not cake. You need all the other stuff. Mm -hmm. And I think that healthy people who hear the content on narcissism, immediately go to, well, I do that sometimes. Mm -hmm. We all do these things sometimes. We are human beings, right? By definition, we're going to do these things. The fact is, though, healthy human beings make amends. They have self-reflection. You might turn Mm -hmm. to a spouse or partner and say, yikes, I I, I talked about my day for 20 minutes, and I didn't even ask you, I am so sorry. Can you imagine a narcissistic person ever doing that in history? Never. Mm. And that's the difference is that when we do have some slippage, when we're not sort of being as interpersonally balanced as we can be, that we we check ourselves right. and we check in with the people we care about and say, I didn't get that right. And I am sorry. We actually take real responsibility, mm. not, not things like, I'm sorry you feel that way. So we that, there's a big difference. Absolutely. Just setting the stage for our listeners that when we're talking about recovering from narcissistic abuse, they can interplay that or interchange that with cult recovery. Absolutely. I mean, listen, it's funny. I just did an interview with with Yanya, Dr. Mm -hmm. Dr. Dr. Yanya Lalich, a few weeks ago, and we were talking about this and that the parallels are are eerie. The the difference is it's probably a cultic structure is much more codified. A narcissistic relational structure is often two people, but you can have cults of two people. Look at Sarah Lawrence. Mm -hmm. It's a cult of seven people. Cults can be quite small, but the fact is, is that all of the apparatus is the same. If anything to me, what a cult is, is that you take all the narcissistic dynamics and it's really colorful. Like I watched the movie Barbie Mm -hmm. recently and everything was like, color. And then I watched Oppenheimer and everything was not color. (laughs) That's to me what a cultic narcissistic system's like. It's everything bright color. So every dynamic is just amped Mm. up, the the volume, the color, all of it. So it's like things like collateralizing someone, which happens in a narcissistic relationship is much more concrete Mm -hmm. in a cultic relationship. Does that make sense? So it's like you take it all and it becomes more, it's almost like they give you a manual for the narcissistic relationship in a family or in in a couple where it's not a, 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 again, an organized cult, you're sort of, it's, it's a, it feels different, but it's exactly the same. It has exactly the same effect. And one could argue that the deprogramming, in essence, we would have to do for somebody who's leaving a cultic system, not to mention things like moral injury and all of that, those are very, very similar dynamics yeah, to what I've always observed in mm-hmm. people who are leaving narcissistic relationships or have become aware of narcissistic mm-hmm. relationships. Such a good point. And we'll be referring people to episode one, which we just re-listened to to prep for this. And it's so good. It's like definitely one of our favorite sure. flagship episodes, especially when people are like, tell me about your podcast and they have no cult 
connection. And I'm like, this is one that like everybody can relate to. It's so helpful. And truthfully, when I started your book, I was like, oh my God, I've read so many books about this. And since leaving, I'm not going to learn anything new about narcissism, but I did. I did. And two things I really would like to point out specifically in regards to our podcast is the concepts of breadcrumbing and future faking and euphoric recall. And those three things before we get into healing, I think is so important in regards to like, in terms of the recovery, understanding the harm that narcissists did in their, either in a cult or one-on-one. Can you explain some of those terms? So breadcrumbing is this process and any narcissistic system, cultic system, it happens where the simplest way to put it is in the relationship, you get indoctrinated into or teach yourself to get by on less and less and less and be willing to turn it into more and more and more. So it would literally be in the simplest example It would be somebody who's in a relationship with a narcissistic person who doesn't communicate, is very shady, is very dismissive, and that person comes home on time for dinner one day out of 10. And the person in the relationship is like, oh my gosh, they came home for dinner and they loved the dinner I cooked for them. Like, we're doing okay. Mm -hmm. And so it is very much, or the person will remember an event and give them a gift and say, oh my gosh, they remember the gift. They're such a good friend. And so not only is most of the relationship characterized by neglect, what it means is that even one tiny showing up gets overinterpreted, overvalued. And the problem is overjustified as a piece of evidence that this relationship is good or healthy or beneficent or this other person's okay. And over time, breadcrumbing is a really insidious dynamic because for a lot of people, it can start early in life. Like they get, and because for kids, kids have to make a relationship with a parent work, including a narcissistic parent. So the narcissistic parent can literally every so often look up from a newspaper and the kid will say, my parent loves me. And all the rest of the time be absent. The child learns at a very early age that love and and close relationships are transactional. What do I need to do to make this person look over their newspaper? And then that expectation gets taken into adult relationships, but it doesn't just happen that way. Some people have perfectly fine family systems growing up, but then they meet someone, they craft a narrative about this is my person, this person's great, I'm really into this person. And if that person's narcissistic and they've done sort of this four to six to eight weeks of love bombing, and that's all the investment they were ever going to put in, and then the devaluing happens, the person has those couple of months of the love bombing to sort of draw from, if you will. And then as the, as the process of pulling out for the narcissistic person happens, then the person is still holding on to that. And in fact, it cuts to the other topic you were asking about, which is euphoric right. recall. Mm-hmm. We, we can selectively, it, it's an interesting kind of a twist in these narcissistic relationships. It's cognitive dissonance. It's cognitive dissonance, but it actually goes against what we know about human nature in a way, because our brains, our nervous systems are actually trained or actually developed to choose threats in our environment. In fact, we selectively remember bad things. And there's an evolutionary adaptation to that. If we can remember which bush had the poison berries, we're going to be less likely to eat the poison berries. If we remember which pathway took us down the, you know, the dangerous creek, we won't go down that pathway again. We are our sympathetic nervous systems, our nervous systems in general, monitor for threat. And in fact, when you look at some of the interesting work on mindfulness, Rick Hansen's work is a great example. He is somebody who said, like, listen, part of what we need to do is mindfulness practices is train our brains to look for good stuff, you know, because we're so trained to, in many, if you will, healthy relationships, people will focus on the one fight they had three weeks ago, but the other three weeks were great. There's this weird, interesting flip because of the trauma bond Mm -hmm. that happens in any narcissistic relationship, which is that a person feels attached to someone where the relationship goes back and forth. It's good and it's bad. It's up and it's down. And because there was a period of really good, and oftentimes there's enablers who are signing off on that relationship. Oh gosh, what a great relationship you have. That the person is then trying to make sense of the confusion. They blame themselves. They get by on the breadcrumbs and they justify the behavior in the relationship. And they keep falling back on just when they say, 
this is really unhealthy. But but gosh, we had such a good time in Miami three years ago. And they'll selectively pull out those good memories, euphoric recall. So it's it's part of that whole trauma bonding mechanism. But the breadcrumbing is, again, it's getting by on so little and really crafting a narrative about how good it is as a result. It's present in almost every narcissistic relationship I've ever seen. After people get educated and they start to learn that well, this isn't healthy, it's almost like a person who, again, I think any of us who are in a scarcity mindset, and I think breadcrumbing is part of a scarcity mindset, and you don't think you deserve more because that's what the narcissistic relationship tells you. You don't deserve more. You're not enough. How dare you ask for more? How dare you have a need? How dare you have a want? All of that gets taken away. The person's sense of self gets taken away and the breadcrumbing really kicks in. For more background on what brought us here, check out Sarah's page-turning memoir. It's called Scarred, the true story of how I escaped Nexium, the cult that bound my life. It's available on Amazon, Audible, and at most bookstores. If you want to see that story in streaming form, watch both seasons of The Vow on HBO. When it comes to gifting, it's truly the thought that counts. There's also the fun element of surprise that you don't get when you're shopping for yourself, like I tend to do. But you know what you do get when you're shopping for yourself? Exactly what you wanted. And if you're buying jewelry for yourself, there's no better place to do it than BlueNile.com. Blue Nile offers thousands of independently graded diamonds and fine jewelry at prices significantly below traditional retail. So whether you're looking for something special to get yourself or to give the best gift of all time to a loved one, Blue Nile offers some of the highest quality standards in the industry. Take the classic route with a white gold tennis bracelet, hint, hint, and if you want it for my birthday, or snap on some modern and stylish diamond huggy hoops, which are obviously very in right now. There's a ton of options to choose from. Feeling a bit overwhelmed? Me too, I get it. But if you have questions, Blue Nile's jewelry experts are on hand 24-7 via phone or chat. From technical questions to budget suggestions, they're here to help you find the piece you can feel great about, whether you're gifting it to yourself or someone else. I've been curious about the perfect length for an everyday necklace lately, and I can't wait to grill the Blue Nile experts on the topic. I am going to take them to the mat. I've also been browsing the site's design your own pendant feature, and I look forward to finding the perfect chain to pair it with. Blue Nile also offers peace of mind with every purchase. With 30-day returns and a diamond price match guarantee, they make online jewelry shopping easy, which shouldn't be a surprise because they've been doing it since 1999. So what are you waiting for? Go to BlueNile.com to find the perfect piece today. That's BlueNile.com. BlueNile.com. Enjoy! Papa Murphy's Triple Pet Pizza is the perfect harmony of three different types of pepperoni all together on one delicious take-and-bake pizza. Like our mini cup pepperoni, it's a little cup of crunch in every bite. And our classic pepperoni, the go-to all-time favorite pizza topping. And don't forget our giant pepperoni. It's perfect for the biggest pepperoni lovers. So order Papa Murphy's limited time triple pet pizza for just $12.99 today. You've heard from our sponsors. Now let's get back to a little bit culty, shall we? It's always a pleasure to have Dr. Romani on our show. If you're interested in exploring more of her work around narcissism, pick up one of her two books, Should I Stay or Should I Go? Surviving a Relationship with a Narcissist and Don't You Know Who I Am? How to Stay Sane in an Era of Narcissism, Entitlement, and Incivility. And since this was written, I have been promoting her third book, which I love and I think is my favorite book of hers. It's Not You. I think I recommended it to to more people than any other book I've recommended on this podcast, maybe other than Take Back Your Life by Yanya Lalich. A wonderful book for learning how to deal with narcissists and not just like cut them out of your life because they're everywhere on the spectrum, of course. Mm -hmm. And you have to learn how to navigate their behavior so you can be sane. And finally, to top off our trio of therapy sessions, our final snippet comes from Dr. Christine Cocciola. Our episode with Christine explored identifying and healing from coercive control. That includes everything from emotional isolation and financial control to an abusive conservatorship a la Britney Spears. Here's Christine. Can you define coercive control and what it means? What we know now in the field is that coercive control is the foundation of literally any kind of abuse. So it's certainly the foundation of most domestic abuse, for sure, because 
situational violence is something that occurs very rarely. And it occurs when perhaps two people have a maladaptive coping that is anger. And so they might hit or push when they're angry, right? But coercive control is everything else. And it's based on this power and control. And what I think you guys are trying to highlight and so many people are now is that coercive control happens in systems all of the time. And it is how people have power over others, power over. And so, you know, what I always tell my clients is that our goal is to have personal power in relationships. That's not a bad thing. That's a really good thing. But when there's inequality in a relationship, and we see this, of course, with, I mean, things like racism, like this is an example of coercive control. And so what we know is that it's often non-physical and that it is a psychological harm. And actually in the field, there's a lot of research that talks about it as psychological maltreatment, not even just psychological abuse, because psychological abuse, abuse actually means something that is overt, something that we can see. And neglect, like when we think about child abuse, right? Neglect is usually something that we can't see. And we call it an act of omission because someone didn't actually supposedly, supposedly, by the way, intend to harm someone where abuse is usually intentional. And so maltreatment covers both abuse and neglect. And it is something that impacts, and I also try to veer away from emotional abuse. And I'll tell you why, because emotional abuse is something that harms me emotionally. It makes me afraid. It makes me anxious. All of those things that are going on. But psychological, when we use that term, it actually encompasses trauma on the brain. So it not only impacts my anxiety level, my fears, my sadness, those things, but it also, we know, is actually changing the brain. Like literally the organ of the brain is changing. That's fascinating. So yeah, I mean, it, it truly is remarkable when we, and I'll just segue for a moment into this whole idea, which is really my area of, of focus is the impact on children, right? So when children are coercively controlled, how the developing, like you guys went into this horrible experience, but you were both adults when you went into it. Imagine a child and the developing brain actually being put into that kind of circumstance and how much trauma and long-standing impact that has. So, so this psychological maltreatment or abuse, as a lot of people call it, is the gaslighting, is manipulation, intimidation, isolation, threatening behavior, diminishing you as a person, taking away your autonomy. Dr. Evan Stark calls it unknowing what we know. Isn't that so true? Yeah. I got chills when you say that. And everything you just said, in case our audience hasn't connected the dots yet, but all those things are the same thing that a cult leader does. Exactly. Cult of one. Trauma on the brain. Yes. And unknowing what we know. Unknowing what we know. It's like, that's exactly like, dis, we've, we've always called it dismantling our intuition, that we felt our intuition got dismantled. Yeah, it puts a lot of valuable language to things that a lot of people don't have language for. Yeah, it's, it truly is about like linguistically connecting people to their experiences. So he has another great quote that I'll share with you. It's like carpenter ants in a house, slowly devouring. Like you don't even know it's going on. You don't even see it. You don't hear it. You don't see it. You don't know it's going on, but then the foundation falls. So it's a stripping away of your autonomy. And that happens, of course, in domestic violence, where one person has a position of power over you. That is exactly what happened in my situation just slowly eroding away. And I don't even like to say self-esteem because frankly, I had great self-esteem in my career. It's a great distinction. Yeah. So some people may have some self-worth issues. That's certainly true. And I always say self-worth is a continuum. Listen, I may have low self-esteem in a crowd maybe, but not in my like work in a classroom or something, which I don't have low self-esteem in a crowd, by the way, pretty social. But anyway, the point is, is that it's a continuum and it's not a blanket effect. But these abusers are actually just taking away our ability to know who we really are. Who am I? I no longer know. I think I'm a bad mother. Would you argue that knowing who you are is sometimes hinged on being connected to them 
or through their filter. Yeah. If they are the person who is diminishing you all of the time, even if it's covertly, you don't even know what's going on, right? The carpenter ants kind of thing, right? If they are diminishing you all the time, then aren't they the people that perhaps you're looking for for affirmation? Mm -hmm. The crumb. Mm -hmm. A crumb. The crumb of affirmation. Yeah. We've talked about that a few times in the podcast, how Keith would dole out these little crumbs, little, little crumbs. Do you remember in season one of The Vow where they had, Keith had me like up on, it wasn't stages, but it was in front of all my peers practicing the new sales pitch. And, he, and you don't see the full thing, but it was going on for hours, like drills. And I was like determined to not give up and not cry and not be humiliated. And I was humiliated. And then at the end, he was like, good job. It was like the only time I ever got a compliment from him. And, I, and it meant something to me. And I can only imagine what it was like for the women who were with him you know, and wanting that from, in in some of their cases, like their lover, but also the source of fixing everything. But there was a level, I think you were susceptible to it though, Sarah. So I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, that was the level to which you were susceptible. The people who ended up being in his inner circle were maybe even targeted more or more susceptible because for various case-by-case reasons. And I was susceptible to a different degree. Yeah. I mean, I think I was susceptible to even just being like, to getting on the straight path and like, and tell, please share your analysis, Dr. C. But what I resonated with, you know, hearing some of your other interviews is that I am accommodating and I am a fixer. And so, yeah, I saw you say, I heard you say that a couple of times. Talk to us about that. Yeah. So I actually, the research study that I completed, it's called Perfect Prey. And the idea behind it is that, so Jeffrey Young and Janet Clasgo do this 11 Life Traps book, and it talks about maladaptive coping schemas. And because we all have them, right? And so we may grow up, it may be because of our development, it may be how we're born, it might be culture, but certainly in particular for women, there is a a people pleasing, like just how do we make everything right? How do we fix things? And so that maladaptive coping is called subjugation, which you guys are familiar with, right? And so our people who have that as one of their traits, and by the way, Dr. Sandra Brown calls it a super trait because it means that we kind of just want everyone to be happy. (laughs) You know, we're not like, we're not making the neighbor cookies because we're trying to kiss their ass. We're making the neighbor cookies because we think it might make their day, you know, like that's just like how it is. And so do those traits set us up to be perfect prey? And the answer is a resounding yes. And then would a narcissistic coercive controller ever be attracted to anyone who doesn't have those traits? First of all, if I'm a narcissist, then I don't like myself. I know that I'm not a decent human being. I don't like who I am. So I'm going to surround myself with people who I do like so I can mirror that, right? So there's that. But then am I going to be around someone who's going to maybe dictate to me what to do? Or am I going to be around someone who's constantly trying to make me happy and, and fix things? And so, you know, Young and class go talk about these like identity characteristics. It's like, it's totally is people pleasing to some degree. It's giving more than taking. Think of all the people you know who are givers in relationships. How readily have they been harmed by other people? Betrayed over and over, betrayal trauma, right? Betrayed over and over again in relationships. Like what you hear, do you? Give us a rating, a review, and subscribe on iTunes. Every little bit helps us get this cult awareness content out there. Smash that subscribe button. You know you want to. We're so grateful to Dr. Kojiola for talking to us and how she felt so comfortable to share her personal experience. Coercive control takes on so many different shapes and styles, and when you're into it, it can be nearly impossible to identify, like Christine's experience. From cult leaders to partners or parents, Coercive controllers walk among us. Okay, folks, there you have it. Our quick crash course in cult psychology from a collection of past guests. Our therapy session may be up this week, but we'll be back in your feed with new episodes very soon. Thank you all for listening. And if you want some special bonus content, you know where to find us on Patreon, where, as promised, we have brand new exclusive interviews with former Nexium members that you've never heard of before. And for all you Nexium nerds out there, Yas Queen Slay. Yas Queen Slay. Happy summer. Sinking down to the depths of the ocean. I'm hanging on to the weight of my love. If I let go of it all, I could leave. But I know I won't. 
Thanks for listening, everyone. We're heading over to patreon.com slash a little bit culty now to discuss this episode. In the meantime, dear listener, please remember this podcast is solely for general informational, educational, and entertainment purposes. It's not intended as a substitute for real medical, legal, or therapeutic advice. For cult recovery resources and to learn more about seeking safely in this culty world, check out a little bit culty.com slash culty resources and don't miss Sarah's TED Talk called How Cult Literate Are You? Great stuff. A Little Bit Culty is a Trace 120 production, executive produced by Sarah Edmondson and Anthony Nippy Ames, in collaboration with producer Will Rutherford at Citizens of Sound and our co creator and show chaplain slash bodyguard, Jess Temple Tardy. And our theme song, Cultivated, is by John Bryant.